I'll be reading Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large milestone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into internal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing to cause any of these little ones is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. The word of the Lord. All right, it's so good to be here. Um, I love St. Mo's. You know, I, I'm always, whenever I come, always, I'm always reminded of how much I love St. Mo's. And one of the things I love is that you do these prayers in, in your services for these ministries and these churches. Um, you know, we live in a world where sometimes church leaders can be a little bit competitive and, you know, territorial, and it's such a, it's such a, a countercultural thing to pray for other churches and other ministries. And, and you know, when I was a, uh, I'm a pastor at Grace Life Church in Catonsville now, but I used to be a pastor at another church in the city, and, and I would get these texts every now and then from Ian, and um, he said, hey, I'm praying for your church this week in, in our service, and it just meant the world to know that there are other people like that uh, in, in the city. And uh, another thing I love about St. Mo's is you have a ton of call students who show up at 9 a.m. You know, it's uh, mind-blowing because when I, uh, uh, when I was a college student, usually I would make it my intention to go to church, but I would almost always attend the church with the latest service. And so that's, that's amazing that you show up at 9 a.m. Um, anyways, I love, I love your, uh, just your heart for partnership, your heart to bring in people from other churches to speak to bring other people to lead worship, um, you know, and I, I appreciate uh, Pastor Ian's friendship, you know, every now and then he's just asking me uh, how I'm doing, or he's inviting me to bourbon in his backyard or something, so that's great. Anyway, today I want to talk about something that's been on my heart for um, a number of years, and it's titled God's Heart for the Wanderer. God's Heart for the Wanderer. Over the past several years, I've been running more and more into these people who I like to call wanderers. And uh, what I mean by wanderers is this, people who used to attend church pretty regularly, pretty consistently, pretty faithfully. And then at some point or another, whether slowly or suddenly, they stopped going to church. But there's still something in them that clings to Jesus still. And I've been running into a lot of these folks, and, and, and it's, it's been mind-boggling to me how many of these people there are. And maybe you've run into some of these people yourself, or maybe you yourself identify in such a way. 
Um, and you know, there are many different reasons why people may wander, why uh, we may wander. Uh, sometimes uh, it's because of sin in our own lives. That is one of the reasons why people wander. And this is uh, implied in the song, Come Thou Founts, the classic hymn, where it goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. All right, so this is a kind of wandering where there's something inside of you uh, that is against God's will, and it is drawing you away from God, and you're wandering away from God. And so that is one reason why some people wander. But there are other types of wandering that aren't rooted in sin, at least your own, kind, your own sin. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of you shifting your Christian theology. Maybe you used to believe some doctrine, and then things come up in your life where you read some books and you start to wonder, is that really true? And you start to wonder, maybe I believe this instead, but it's misaligned with your church. And so you don't feel like you fit in to your, your old church tradition anymore, and so you start to wander. For others, maybe it's not a theological reason why you wander. Maybe it's a cultural or political reason. Uh, maybe you, your church that you attend uh, has a pretty strong stance on a certain issue, a political issue, a cultural issue, a fill in the blank, and you feel very not at ease because it, it feels like it's attacking you whenever they mention this issue because you're not aligned in that way. And maybe you feel too progressive or you feel too conservative and you don't fit in. And so some of these people, you know, you end up just, you leave. And so for others, maybe the reason is you've been hurt by the church. Um, we've all read, I'm sure, stories of hurt in our modern church, especially in America today. Uh, maybe it's abuse. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's division. Maybe it's adultery. Fill in the blank. There's all sorts of things that can happen in a church that can cause people to feel wounded. And it, they're so wounded that they feel like any time they even step foot in a church, it's like they have PTSD and they, they can't do it anymore. You know, I was talking to an old friend um, a while ago, and uh, she was a college friend. And she, you know, she, she had, as far as I knew her, she was a faithful church attender. And um, to my surprise, she said that she recently left her church. And, um, and I was just asking her about the story, what happened. And she said, you know, she and her husband, they had faith, faithfully been attending this church in the Chicago area for a while, and they loved it. And, and then one day... Uh, their church decided to take a stance on a theological issue that they had never taken a stance on before. And um, they had a feeling that the church, if they were to address this issue, they would land at a certain place. And they knew that they were not at that place. But they always felt like, it's okay. It's, this is not a first order issue for us. And so we could stay. But the way they this church took the stance was so hard line that they felt very uh, afraid and um, she met with her pastor to talk about this issue, she and her husband, and basically she communicated to me that his response basically was, don't let the door hit you on your way out. And, um, and she felt like she had no other choice but to leave. And, um, and she had always sort of prided herself on being like, you know, you never leave a church. That's just not something you do. I mean, if you move, you can switch churches. But that she w it was ingrained in her her whole life. You're never supposed to leave a church. But she just felt like there was no other option. You know, maybe you identify as a wanderer yourself. Maybe you hear all these examples and you're thinking of, you know, incidents that you yourself went through. Or maybe you know someone who's a wanderer. You can, you know, people you went to church with in the past or you went to college ministry with in the past and they're no longer plugged in somewhere. And uh, many of them, for whatever reason, they haven't fully given up on God, but they've given up on the church. So that's who I want to talk about today. You know, earlier we read this parable of the shepherd. I, I, I wanted to read the whole passage leading up to the parable of the shepherd finding the lost sheep. Um, because, you know, this is a thing that I, I've sort of been doing over the past several years is when I grew up, I learned Bible stories in isolation. And so I learned this story and then I learned this story. And then, you, you know, you flip the page in, in your children's Bible and it's like this chapter or whatever. So there's like a new story. And lately what I've been doing is I've been reading whole chunks of scripture together and seeing how a lot of these things are connected. 
And Matthew 18 is one of these chapters that I've been able to see in a new light because I, I try to read the whole thing all together. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I realize I haven't been capturing the whole thrust of the passage. Okay, so if you're not familiar, the, the story of the shepherd leaving the 99 and finding the one, it appears in two places in the Bible. The first is in Matthew 18, and the second is in Luke 15. And if you read the context of both of these stories, they're actually very different. And I think the authors are emphasizing different things in these two passages. So I'm going to nerd out a little bit. I want to dive deep and make a case for why I think Matthew 18 should not be read the same way you read Luke 15. And Luke 15 is about probably people who do not follow Jesus or do not know God, but rather Matthew 18 is about people who actually one point in time were part of the flock but have wandered away. All right, so that's my case. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive deep into Matthew 18, 1 through 14. I'm going to reread some of these things. And uh, I want you to notice how often these little ones, this phrase comes up, all right, these little ones. Um, uh, let's just read it again. Okay, I like scripture. You can't read it too many times. So I'm just going to read it again. Matthew 18, starting from verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes once a child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep... And one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. Who are these little ones? Right, Jesus mentions these little ones several times. Who are they? You know, at first glance, in the very beginning, we see literal children, like physically young humans, all right? And so you might think, oh, these little ones are kids, but I don't think that's true. I think it's a metaphor, right? We see in verse 3 and 4, and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So I think what Jesus is saying is he's not talking about children. He's talking about people who are like children. People who take the position, the lowly position of children. All right. So, so far, what do we know? These little ones, they are people who are lowly, maybe uh, culturally in low statuses. Uh, they are humble. What else do we know about these? Well, they enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, so we can call, what do we call people who enter the kingdom of heaven? We can call them Christians. This can be verified uh, in uh, Matthew 10, 42. This is a, an interesting passage. This is the other place, the only other place in the book of Matthew where this phrase, these little ones appear. All right, and it goes, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose a reward. And so here, the context is also clear. These little ones is... A disciple, Jesus' disciples. All right, so we can say, I think, with confidence that these little ones, so far, they are Christians, and uh, these are humble followers of Jesus. They do not have maybe lofty positions in society. But let's keep going. Verse 5 and 6, I think this will expand this a little more. And whoever welcomes once a child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, and he, again, he describes who they are, those who believe in me, to stumble, and he talks about the millstone. All right, and so if anyone causes these disciples to stumble, 
Jesus' point is it's better if they drowned. All right, so that's, that's some serious language. That's some serious language. So now then we need to ask, what does it mean to cause one of these little ones, one of these disciples to stumble? Well, the verb here is skandalizo, and it can be the, in the Greek, and it can be translated in the New Testament a variety of ways. And one way that is very legitimate is to stumble. And another way that is interesting that this word is also used is to fall away. Okay, so skandalizo can also mean to fall away. And in fact, it's used in the book of Matthew in that exact way in... So bear with me, if, if, you're, if this whole thing's going over your head, okay, just hold on for four minutes, okay? I'll be back to, you know, practical stuff, okay? Matthew 26, 31 to 33, okay, and it goes like this. Then Jesus told them, this very night, this is, he's about to die, he's talking about his death. This very night, you will all fall away, and that's scandalizo, on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, but after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away, there it is again, Scandalito, on account of you, I never will. All right. So what's going on here? The context here is about sheep scattering from the shepherd. That's what Jesus is talking about. Sheep scattering from the shepherd. It's about leaving the flock. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, let's go back to verse 5 and 6. One way to read Matthew, you know, uh, 18 is this. You know, if anyone causes uh, one of my disciples to sin, it would be better for them to be drowned. But I think another way to read this is if anyone causes one of these disciples to fall away and leave the flock, it would be better for them to be drowned. And I think that fits better in this context because in verse 5, it says, welcome these little ones. Right, so verse 5 says, welcome these little ones. And then verse 6 naturally says, don't do anything that would push these little ones away. So do you see that contrast? So it's not about causing them to sin necessarily. It could be. But I think it's also about pushing them away so that they would scatter. All right. And then there are a few verses talking about cutting off the hand and the foot. I won't go into depth there. But I think... I think one thing it's also worth noting is that sometimes it's not other people causing us to fall away. We ourselves are to blame. Our sins ourselves are to blame. And so we need to take careful measures to not fall away ourselves. And then we reach verse 10. And it says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. And so I think, so here's, let's just recap everything so far, all right. So. One through four says, hear these children, be like these little ones. And then verse five, welcome these little ones. And then verse six, you know, don't cause these little ones to fall away, to scatter. And then, you know, seven through nine, this is talking to yourself. If you have sin in your own lives, take care and don't do anything that would cause you to fall away. And then verse 10, do not despise these little ones. All right, and side note. Okay, verse 11 is missing in most Bible translations, and that, this, that's, a, that's a long conversation. But old manuscripts have some verses. I mean, some manuscripts have the verses, some manuscripts don't, and now the consensus is the original didn't. All right. Okay, verse 12 to 14. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So verse 14 uses this phrase, these little ones again. And because you use that phrase, I think it makes sense to read the whole thing together from 1 to 14. And so in that context, what is the meaning of the parable? It's this. If you have a church and one person in the church wanders away from that church, then the father will go out and look for that one who wandered off in order to bring that wanderer back home. I think that's the meaning of the parable. You know, earlier I talked about many different reasons why people may wander away. Maybe it's your own sin. One other reason is that it could be someone else's sin in the church that causes you to wander away. 
And that's why Jesus says, you know, don't despise these little ones. Don't cause these little ones to stumble. Because your sin could actually push people out of the church. And that's why God, in uh, Jeremiah 23, I, I, I get goosebumps every time I read this verse. Jeremiah 23, verse 1, God says something very similar, which is, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. You know, what a chilling verse. Um, you know, throughout history, religious leaders in the church have been responsible, partially, for destroying and scattering the sheep of the pasture. Religious leaders did it in Old Testament times, they did it in New Testament times, and they're doing it today still. The modern church in America, and unfortunately, because there are so many of these shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of the pasture, there are many sheep who are wandering away and they're lost. But thank God for this parable of the lost sheep in Matthew 18. Because what it means is that God will not allow these harmful shepherds to win. He's going he's gonna to bring them back. He's on a mission to seek them out, to seek and save the lost, and to bring them home. So I want to just say um, a quick word to the wanderers out there. And maybe you're in this room and you are wandering, um, or maybe you, you know, you were listening to this recording after the fact and you're wandering. You know, I don't know your story. I don't know why you're wandering. I don't know if how much of it was, is your fault, how much of it is someone else's fault. But here's what I do know. There is a consistent pattern in the Bible of God seeking out the wanderer. It's everywhere in the Bible. I'm just a few examples. Okay, Hagar was suffering from domestic abuse. She was a slave. She wandered away into the wilderness. She was about to die, and God appeared to Hagar. Jacob, he's on the run because he deceived his brother Esau, and Esau's trying to kill him, and he's out in the middle of nowhere, sleeping on a rock, and then God appears to Jacob. And then you have Moses. He's also on the run. Okay, he grew up... In, 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 uh, in wealth in Egypt, he killed an Egyptian. He decided, you know, I'm going to reboot my life, start over where I know nobody. He goes away in the wilderness for 40 years. He lives a whole new life, and then God appears to Moses. And then there's Elijah. Elijah had this big uh, showdown with these altars, right? And the fire came down from heaven, and he seems victorious. And then Queen Jezebel wants to kill him, and so he goes on the run, and he is suicidal even. He asks God to take away his life. Because he's no better than his father's. And then God appears to Elijah. And then there's Jonah. You know, he doesn't want to do God's will. God says, go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, no, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go on a boat and sail over here. And then some sailors, you know, he finally gets to his senses. He repents and some sailors uh, throw him into the ocean. And then God sends a whale, or not a whale, a big fish, to eat him up and spit him out on the dry land. And so we see this pattern everywhere. It doesn't matter if it is your fault that has caused you to wander or it's someone else's fault that has caused you to wander. Whatever the case, we have this pattern in the Bible of God appearing to people in the wilderness who are wandering. You know, when I, uh, when I was a child and I heard this parable in Sunday school with the flannel graph boards, um, and I first heard Jesus ask this question, if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? My reaction was, no, who would do that? <laughs> well, you have 99 over here and you have one over here. Why would you leave the 99 and go get the one? 99 is still, that's 99%. That's an A+. Plus. <laughs> but thank God he's not like me. God is willing to leave the 99 and look for the one that wandered off. And so if you are here and you're wandering, my hope is that this would open your eyes and help you to see that God is looking for you. God is looking for you. 
the places where maybe you left because you, you couldn't fit in there anymore or because they hurt you, God is willing to go to you. <sighs> you know, I'm reminded of Jacob, you know, when God found Jacob in the wilderness uh, and he woke, he got appeared to him in this dream that was the ladder scene and where the angels are going up and down. And then Jacob woke up and he says, this is Genesis 28, 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. Surely the Lord was in this place and I was not aware of it. And I think that's true for so many people who are wandering. God is wandering with them this whole time. And they're just waiting. He's just waiting for the day when you would open your eyes and see, surely the Lord is with me in this wandering. And I was not aware of it. You may not be aware of it, but he is there. And I want you to know this. Jesus is not like other shepherds. He is not like the hired hand who cares nothing for the sheep. He is the good shepherd who chooses to lay down his life for the sheep. And so I'm inviting you to come to Jesus. Come to the good shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for you. And I'll say a quick word to the 99. To those who haven't wandered, who are still part of the flock, I just want to encourage you. Have the same compassion that Jesus has for the one. Have the same compassion. When you see people wandering, don't let them be. Don't just say, oh, you know, they, they weren't committed enough. They weren't dedicated enough. They weren't with, they didn't get it. And so what a shame. They couldn't persevere. Go out to them and be with them and wander with them. Welcome them, advocate them, advocate for them, and do not do anything that would cause them to stumble. Join in God's mission to seek them out. And I want to encourage you, you know, uh, who are part of the 99, think about this. Who are some people in your lives, family members, friends, coworkers, neighbors, kids, friends, parents that you see on the playground every other week, who are these people who are wanderers in your life? And think, how might God use me to help bring them back? I'm reminded of Matthew 9, 36, 38. I'll close with this. And this is Jesus. He, he, and it goes like this. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, there are countless people out there today. There's all sorts of books about it and stats about this, about how there are so many people who are leaving the church. And they're wandering around. And they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So let's make it our aim to find them to wander with them, to sit with them, to listen with them, and to bring them back. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this model of Jesus, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. And, uh, and just how th that is such a contrast to all the bad shepherds we often see in society. We see bad shepherds in secular government. We see bad shepherds running corporations. We see bad shepherds even leading churches. And, uh, and some of us are just so cynical of leadership, of authority as a whole, that we don't want to be a part of the system anymore. But God, we thank you so much that Jesus is the good shepherd, the good king. He's the one we're all looking for. And he has the power to make everything right again. And so I pray, first off, for those of us who are part of the 99, may you give us the eyes to look for those who are wandering, for those who are lost. And may you give us the wisdom, the love, the courage, the, the grace 
to be representatives of Jesus, to be ambassadors of Christ to them and to give them a version of the church, a version of the gospel that would be accurate and it would be true and it would bring them to you. And God, I also want to pray for those among our midst who are in the middle of a wandering season. You know, we don't have a church home and we don't have a sense of belonging. And we view all of this religious stuff with some skepticism. I pray that you break down these barriers, these walls that were constructed by poor representatives of you. And you show us truly who you are, that you are a good father, a loving father who will always fight for us, who will never leave us nor forsake us, who will be with us to the very end. And you proved it because Jesus lived with us, died in solidarity with us, paying the penalty of our sins, and you rose from the grave in victory to show us that there is hope. No matter what happened yesterday, there is hope for tomorrow. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I do want to encourage you, if you would like to receive prayer, uh, there are these prayer stations right here uh, on my left, on your right. Um, maybe you are wandering and you're looking for a way to come back home. Or maybe you want God to use you, to equip you, to be his messenger to the lost. If that's you, if you identify that way, uh, come out over here and then 